Welcome to the Engineering Influence Podcast from the American Council of Engineering Companies. Uh, today, we are focusing in on the future of uh, transportation, especially mass transit. And we're talking to an expert in that field. Very pleased uh, to be joined today, today by Stuart Lerner. He is the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for Stantec North America. Uh, Stu has more than 30 years of experience in the transportation infrastructure and transit oriented uh, uh, world, as well as experience in, in heavy civil infrastructure work. Uh, before joining uh, Stantec in, in, in 2007, uh, Stu had uh, progressed through several leadership roles, including serving as a transit and rail leader, transportation business line leader, and business operating unit leader for infrastructure. Uh Stu is uh, someone who has been very, very uh, involved in just multimodal transportation, and, and it's a he's perfect expert to be uh, to join us today to talk about this issue. Stu, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Glad to be here. So, Stuart, uh, let's start off, I guess, with your story here. I mean, you know, you you've been very ingrained in um, mass transit in civil infrastructure. Why, why is the issue of, of, of um, mass transit and kind of the future of, of transportation very you know, important to you? Well, Jeff, as you mentioned, I've you know, been involved with mass transit for literally decades now. And the, not only that, but I've also been commuting to Midtown Manhattan for literally the same period of time. It kind of goes back to the early 90s when I was starting a family. And, you know, the long story short is simply that I was trying to evaluate where to live and commuting was certainly one of the largest factors as to where to live. And I decided that I would try to catch a living in a station, a living in a location that was only less than 25 miles from New York City. And the train ride would be something more manageable, let's say less than 40 minutes. And I found that location and that it was all great, except for the fact that as all commuter, mass transit commuters especially know that there's more to the commute than the train ride. There's the getting to the station, there's the parking at the station, there's the waiting for the train, and then, of course, there's getting from the station in New York City to your final work location. And all that added up to more than 75 minutes. A good day was when I caught the rocket train. You know, the rocket train took me from Midtown Manhattan to my suburban location, Express, and maybe I could get in close to an hour in my door-to-door commute. The commuter war stories were legendary. We used to kind of regale them at a various cocktail hour or two, who could outdo who, who got stuck on the bridge, who got stuck in the station, who got stuck in the tunnel. We tried to outdo each other, and there was a bit of folklore. But the point being is, is that these war stories were legendary, and similar to the way the horse and buggy, hopefully they will go away as we get into the future. Yeah, I know we all have our stories, and it is kind of interesting how it was. it was always the fight of who had the worst. I mean... I'd have my stories when I lived in New York City, and I'd commute from Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, all the way into Midtown Manhattan. Um, and now in Virginia, of course, the the Washington D.C. Beltway is 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 uh, you know famous in its own right for uh, terrible commutes and and just you know before the express lanes came in, it was a question of whose uh, commute was going to be under an hour just to go ten miles. Uh, so you know things like this are are, are hopefully you know, going to be going away uh, as as we invest in more uh, innovative transportation systems. Uh, you know, how in your mind, how, how can those stories kind of dissipate? How can we move beyond the bumper to bumper, you know, uh, traffic and, and and just everybody kind of getting on the roads and just just, you know, not looking at other opportunities for for transportation or improving uh, the likelihood for somebody to choose mass transit over their car. Well, transportation, as you said, has evolved a lot. Uh, it's evolved a lot, especially in the last hundred years or so. Uh, but the issues associated with the pandemic and climate change are magnifying those changes to what's going to happen with transportation, especially in urban centers, which have really been generated, developed because of the mass transit capabilities. There's going to need to be changes to the economics of uh, commuting and, and the environment, the so environmental impacts associated with commuting, the safety associated with commuting. The overall quality of life has got to improve with uh, commuting. In the New York City region, uh, the governor of New York paused what they call congestion pricing. Congestion pricing, which exists in places like Stockholm and London and Singapore, was going to take some mass transit uh, well, it's going to take some toll revenues generated by that congestion pricing and going to fund the mass transit. Uh, the MTA website says that roughly 80 percent 
of the toll revenues that are going to be generated by mass uh, by uh, tolls was going to be funding the mass transit movements. And specifically, a billion and a half was going to go into the commuter railroads of Long Island Railroad and Metro North each. Uh, they, these are suburbs of New York City from the east and from the north of uh, Midtown Manhattan. The government paused those uh, congestion pricing because, for a variety of factors because of the impacts and maybe more study needs to be happened. But the fact of the matter is the studies have been going on for five years. Something we really need to figure out how, uh, as we go forward. What, what do you think? How was that received in New York? Because you're right. I mean, it's not as though this is it's an absolutely new idea. It's, it's Maybe it's new to the United States, but Europe certainly has been leading the charge on congestion pricing. London, I think, was one of the first cities to put it in, into effect. And, and you know, it's not as though it's a revolutionary concept outside of the U.S. How was it accepted in New York when it was first proposed by the governor? It's very controversial, and quite frankly, there is not widespread acceptance, although there is definitely a need for funding mass transit. The question is, how do we do that? You know, one would think that I'd be a personal advocate of congestion pricing, and I am an advocate for uh, congestion pricing, but not for all of the way the plan was, and I do think it needs some modifications. There are questions with respect to how all the money was going to be spent. Uh, cities such as New York City have become very prominent in the world as a result of this mass transit system. But ridership, as I said, is down due to the pandemic. And likely, the while the ridership is coming back to normal levels within the core of Manhattan or within the core of the five boroughs, I should say, it's not necessarily coming back the way it was in the suburbs. Commuter rail itself is down. The off-peak ridership uh, has increased within the five boroughs. But in, in suburbia, people only come into the office three or four days a week. And that, as a result, is driving the ridership down. This is creating a problem, a conundrum for the various uh, mass transit agencies. They used to subsidize roughly 50 percent of the mass transit ridership. Now that subsidy has to get even higher because of the reduced ridership. This is creating a larger problem, creating a bit of a downward spiral in the overall uh, mass transit operations it's not financially sustainable yeah so there has to be an alternative because you're right i mean it's it's endemic in the dc area of course i mean the largest population of, of workers is federal government and they're re, re, you know really reacting negatively to being forced back into the office post covid i mean everybody wants to work remotely um a lot of companies are you know, half week, three days a week, the city is still largely empty. Nothing Traffic is nothing compared to what it used to be. Um, but at the same time, those, you know, fewer people, less fair box income. Um, how is the, the pandemic going to drive these changes in, in mass transit? Um, you know, how, how do you see an exit path from this issue of, of you know, the, you can't subsidize um, these lines, you know, w without the passenger ridership to actually keep them going on, it's not a sustainable thing. Yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right. Uh, commuter rail goes back to uh, literally a, a hundred years or more, back to the mid 1800s. Quite frankly, one could argue uh, that back then, when they started these systems, it was highly efficient. You could move hundreds of people with a relatively small amount of power and a small amount of energy. Steel wheels on steel rails is a particularly efficient way, an energy efficient way of moving. High, high volumes of people, but things have changed, as you said, Jeff. You know the work schedules are much more variable, and it's creating this predicament for the various uh, rail agencies, such as v VRE down by you, or up here in uh, in Manhattan, or up in Boston, etc. The ridership is not likely to recover to the pre-pandemic levels, especially on the commuter rail lines, for the foreseeable future. It's going to create this downward spiral. Uh, Carters are. The rail cars are generally used less than 10% of the time. Think of all the deadhead trains or the trains that operate at large headways more than 30 minutes. All of this creates a large amount of inefficiency on those rail cars. The uh, past solution to solving this economic problem of inefficiency was really to get external funding, such as the congestion pricing. But the cost of capital improvements for these mass transit improvements has become more exorbitant than ever before. And quite frankly, it's going to take decades for a lot of these improvements to pay for themselves. The cost-benefit ratios just are not there. And that's you know, a, independent of some of the other things that occur on rail systems. Other inefficiencies are created by climate change. You know, there was lots of disruptions 
uh, throughout the Northeast uh, due to a variety of factors this summer, whether it was uh, flooding, whether it was heat, whether it was isolated events on the rail lines and due to passenger issues, et cetera. All of this creates a tremendous amount of inefficiency that needs to be improved and addressed by the rail agencies. Is the future more of a hybrid approach, multimodal bus rapid transit to light rail to um, some something ride share or something at the end of the station terminus? Is it is it a lot of different uh, modes coming together? Maybe some that are publicly financed, some that might be like maybe like Brightline in Florida, which are privately financed or a hybrid. Uh, uh, you know, is it, it, it doesn't seem like the. The, the one size fits all publicly financed transit system is is really the path of the future. I couldn't agree more. The one size fits all, which was applicable for the last hundred years or so, that's got to change. We need to embrace new technology. You know, the Roman chariot has gone away. Electronic tolling has made the need for toll plazas widening to go away. In fact, all that congestion of toll plazas that used to exist 10, 20 years ago has now gone away. The need for even Doing a map preparation on a trip that you've never taken before has gone away. You now just use your smartphone, type in the final destination, and let the phone do the work for you. The transport, uh, the transporting public has adapted new technology, and so do the agencies. They need to jump on board. Yeah. There are autonomous systems in places, such as mass transit systems, such as in Honolulu or in Vancouver. Uh, there's lots of investigation of bus rapid transit systems, as you said, Jeff. Mm-hmm. All of that needs to be considered. I would advocate that we should be considering autonomously operated uh, rubber tire tram systems uh, on a variety of dedicated corridors. It, it, probably the, these trams could have the flexibility to go off corridor in the event of an emergency or a tree falling on a catenary wire, any one of those types of things. Also, this automated rubber tire system would have provide for some flexibility as far as operations. It could scale up and scale down based on ridership demand, not just so much what Uber and Lyft do, and also require less storage of vehicles. All of this is beneficial to the transit agencies. And that technology isn't new. That's been around for a while, right? The fact that you could actually take something that's on a rail, but at the same time, it can exit the rail if necessary. And you have that ability to work on both ways, road and then also on, you know, straight line. Um, are there any other cities in the in the world that really maximize that or, or, or use that to good uh, good use? I can't say I know of any particular systems that are going off fixed rail onto rubber tire systems, but there are definitely lots of rubber tire systems. And as I spoke of, there is autonomous systems on fixed rail. So we need to kind of consolidate those two technologies into a singular technology. And I mean, I'd be an advocate for not spending as much money on the fixed rail systems that the commuters, uh, the commuter rail agencies are doing and doing a more robust cost benefit analysis with respect to the overall operation of a, a system. Uh, there's talk of things like flying taxis, you know, the laws of physics will not really make that energy efficient anytime soon. So I think we just really need to make sure that the rail agencies are adopting new technology uh, to provide for flexible and reliable advancements in transportation. They, they need to be able to adapt to the world of the pandi- post-pandemic world where there's less ridership. And they also need to adapt to the needs of uh, climate change as well. Yeah, there will be flying taxis, but not for not for everyone, right? It's uh, it's either going to be for people who are, uh, you know, yeah, can, can afford it or need to go short distances, but nobody's going to be trying to make a, a long commute on a flying taxi. Um, that's, 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 It'll be interesting to see how that develops, but it seems like um, there's uh, there there are uh, enough enough. There's proof and concept. I mean, the technology there for autonomous vehicles, especially when you're looking at the freight freight industry, and the way that they have started to do autonomous convoying of tractor trailers. Tesla, for for you know whatever you think of Tesla, I mean their their trucks that they're designing, they've put through a lot of a lot of rigorous testing over uh, actual miles. Of, of autonomous um, um, and, and, and electric, you know, really improving their, their electric system. So the technology is there. The question is the political will to actually leverage it and, 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 and move it forward. Um, so, Stuart, what are, you, what are you hearing from your clients when you're looking at doing something like an institutional project that you just wrapped up, one of the EEA winning projects on uh, Long Island Railroad, and uh, – expanding the number of, of rail lines into Manhattan for for eastbound traffic or, or something that's a little bit more, you know, 
I don't know, compact or, or not a large, you know, civil infrastructure project. What, what are your clients saying about how they want to get people to their locations? Um, and, and, you know, are, are, are they also thinking broader than just, hey, let's make sure that we incorporate a metro stop here or something like that? Yeah, there are certainly some clients that are saying that the traditional way of expanding a tra uh, transit system, a mass transit system, specifically a commuter rail system, needs to be reinvestigated. As I said, they're looking into bus rapid transit as an example, as an alternative. Some are looking into the autonomous uh, transit operations. Others are still very much stuck on the fixed rail systems, how to expand that, or at least how to make them operate more efficiently. So it's a mixed bag depending on which client and uh, what their funding streams are. Got it. It's very, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating topic. It's something that I know that, you know, every single time, well, we'll see what happens because IIJA, of course, is going to be expiring. You're going to have the opportunity for another uh, service bill. You're going to have another opportunity for a rail bill. Um, and, and all these things kind of fill, fill in. Um, it would be nice to see some of these technologies make it outside of a research title and actually start getting funded and, 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 and really putting some public investment behind it. Um, any final thoughts as we wrap up here? I mean, it seems like uh, the, it, it's clear. I mean, the one thing that is clear in the conversation, it stirs, st you know, the status quo cannot stand. Uh, there needs to be a change and we need to embrace that change. But uh, any other thoughts before we uh, before we wrap up? Yeah, I would just double down on what you just said. We need to embrace change. and It has to come through technology. You know, I, I drove I, I use the electronic tolling example as how change in transportation has really had a dramatic impact by the use of new technology. That same logic needs to be utilized by the mass transit agencies so that we can have more flexible and reliable systems as we go forward. Fantastic. Well, uh, Stuart Lerner, again, he is the uh, Chief Operating Officer and Executive Vice President at Stantec North America. Uh, very involved over decades in, in the issues of mass transit and civil infrastructure. I really appreciate you joining us today for this conversation. It's going to be the first, not the last, um, and on a very, very interesting topic. So, Stu, thank you very much again. Thank you, Jeff. And again, this has been Engineering Influence, a podcast for the American Council of Engineering Companies, and we'll see you next time.